All right, good evening, Redeeming Grace Outreach Worship Center. Give praise to God tonight. Amen. Come on, that's a little weak. Y'all can do better than that. Give praise to God tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I, I ain't letting a little bit of snow scare us away. I know these people didn't travel all the way from Maryland, right? Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God is going to do a great work tonight. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. I'm going to tell you, man, this week has just been amazing and powerful, and what God has been doing is just opening my mind even more and more to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do and the direction that he wants us to go. And I just say to all of you, stay faithful. Stay faithful to the work of the ministry. Stay faithful to the call. Be ready in season and out of season for what God is trying to do through you. And understand that he is working all things together for the good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. So no matter what challenge you're facing right now in life, no matter what you're going through, there is nothing that God can't fix. There's nothing that's too far down that God can't change it. God can always reach down farther than you could ever reach, and he can go farther than you could ever go. And so I just ask that we continue to trust him, we continue to worship him, and that as we open up tonight, that we would open up not just these doors, here, Father God, Lord, that he would open up our hearts, amen, that we would open up our hearts to Jesus and we say, Jesus, whatever it is that's in me that's holding me back from everything that I need, God, I just pray that you move it like you would move the mountains, God. I pray that you would dissipate it right now in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. and amen. Well, hallelujah. I'm going to tell you guys, this, this, uh, this, this coming week, you need to be in prayer because so many people have been losing loved ones left and right. And I know with how the winters have been and how the ice and everything's been, man, things have been crazy. So just if you're an intercessor, be praying. Be praying for the ministry. Be praying for the people. I know there's a lot of people that couldn't make it out tonight, you know, due to the weather or whatever. But at the end of the day, we just want to just trust God and believe that he's going to do something great in our life. So if you will, stand to your feet and let's worship him in spirit and in truth. Brother, you got something to say? You sure you ain't got nothing from the Lord on your heart right now? I'll drop this mic right now. I just feel like you, like you got something on your heart that you could share, man. When it hits you, you tell me. How many of y'all know tonight that God is, God is worthy and deserving of our praise? That he is everything that we could ever need? Richard, I'm going to ask that you keep the lights on back here, but turn the ones off up here. I just want uh, everybody to be in focus tonight on what God is doing and not on what everybody else is doing. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. For you deserve the glory. Come 
on, put your hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because you deserve the glory. Oh, I exalt thee. Well, I exalt thee. Well, I next part he says well day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day let incense arise day and night night and day So worthy of it all, for from you are all things, and to you are all things, for you deserve the glory. One more time. I exalt thee. church give Jesus a hand clap tonight give him praise all through the building amen hallelujah I'm gonna tell you he is so worthy he's so good his mercy endures forever and I just want God to set a fire down in our soul that we can't contain, that we can't control. God, we want more of you. We want every bit of you, God. We want it all, God. We want you more than life itself, God. 
So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Oh, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. There's no place I would rather be. There's no place I would rather be. Yeah, no place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. There's no place I would rather be. No place I would rather be, yeah. No place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. No place I would rather be. There is no place I would rather be. There is no place I would rather be than hearing you love, hearing you love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. Yeah, no place I would rather be than hearing you love, hearing you love. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more. I want more. I want more. So much more. I want more. I want more. Won't you pour it out? Pour it out. I want more. more. Come on church, say would you pour it out. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No, no place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. Yeah. No place I would rather be than hearing you love, hearing you love. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. Yeah. No place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love. You set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. 
Church, there's no place that I'd rather be, no, no place that I'd rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love, no place I would rather be, yeah, no place I would rather be, yeah, no place I would rather be than hearing your love, hearing your love, would you set a fire? down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control I want more of you God so set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more. Oh, Father God, would you use us, God, tonight? Would you anoint us with the fire of the Holy Ghost, God, a passion down inside of our hearts that we can never control? I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more. sing that with me tonight church would you sing that with me tonight church say I want more 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 Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more. I'm going to tell you guys, listen, I'd, I'd have no rather place that I want to be right now than here in God's presence and here with you people tonight. I'm telling you, the presence of God is so thick in this place. We don't even got a drummer in here tonight drumming. We don't got an electric guitarist, nothing, but we just we just singing from our hearts with a piano, and God is just moving inside this place tonight. And I believe that if you would empty out your heart, if you'd empty out your mind, if you'd empty out your soul, and you say, Jesus, I, I just want more of you, Jesus. Jesus, I know that you love me, Jesus. I just want more of you. Every part of me yearns for you. Every part of me wants your love, God. I just need your love tonight. God would pour his love out upon you. The Bible says in the last days that my spirit would be poured out among all the flesh that your sons and daughters would prophesy that your old men would have dreams. Your young men would have visions. My God church, we're in the last days. I know that the Bible says that in the last days there would be a great falling away and that people would run and that they'd have tickling ears heaping up for themselves. Teachers not heeding to sound doctrine but listening to every 
everything that they want to listen to, every wind of doctrine. But tonight I pray that we could have a heart that would be focused on God and that we would have a heart that would be set on fire tonight. Would you just shout it out? Say, set me on fire, Lord. Oh, set me on fire. Come on, church. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Just set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. If you will, just reach over to your left side right now. Take your hand, take your hand, your right hand, stick it up in the air. And reach over to your left side and unclick your seatbelt for a moment and just throw it away. You've been out the car for a hot minute now. Amen. We're in the presence of Almighty God. He's in this place. There is no doubt in my mind that Daddy has showed up inside of this place, that his presence is flowing so thick like a cloud inside of this place. There's no doubt in my mind, Daddy, I know you're here tonight, and I just pray your presence would flow down through this place, Father. And I pray that a, 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 a Holy Ghost fire would break forth tonight, God, and that you would set a fire inside of our souls, God, that we'd chase hell with a water pistol, God, that we'd walk Walk in the anointing of almighty you, God. Lord, that we trust in you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding, God. But in all of our ways, we would acknowledge you, God, and that you would direct our paths, God. For you're the way maker. You're the miracle worker, God. You are who you said you are, God. God, you promised to do what you said you promised to do, God. There's no place that I'd rather be but in your presence here tonight, God. And if we sing one song inside of this place tonight, God, May it be a song that adores you, God. May it be a song that lifts you up, God. You are worthy, worthy. Come on, church, shout worthy. Tell him how he's worthy. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Come on, somebody shout. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. worthy of it all you were worthy of it all you were worthy of it all my God my God my God you are so worthy oh hallelujah hallelujah he's so worthy church oh my God hallelujah I heard the Holy Ghost said my glory is shining among you take heed that you do not walk away from my presence tonight that you would be in my presence and stand still and see the salvation of our God stand still and see his salvation for he is good and his mercy endures forever from everlasting to everlasting he is king he is God and he is Lord you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all Come on, give Jesus a big shout of praise tonight. Somebody lift up your Bibles tonight. Go ahead, take your Bible, lift it in the air. And say, this is how I fight my battle. 
Now smack your knees and say, now these are how I fight my battle also. Come on, somebody say, these are how I fight my battle. I'm going to tell you, it may look like you're surrounded, like the devil's got you out. Like the devil's calling out with AR-15s in the spiritual realm and he's saying, I've got you surrounded, your house is surrounded, your wife is surrounded, your children are surrounded. And, and, and he's saying, you might as well come up with your hands up in the air. And God's like, hold up, hold up, hold up, because the last time I checked, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you're not surrounded by the enemy. My God, my God, my God, you're surrounded by the king of kings. My God. My God, my God, my God, you're surrounded by the Lord of Lords. My God, my God, my God, we're not surrounded by the devil. We're surrounded by Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. We're surrounded by Jehovah Nisi, the God who reigns in victory. Come on, church. We're surrounded by Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. That in any unpeaceful situation, God would walk inside of your life and say, I'm calling you out to be more than you've been. To be more than just a, a, a drug addict. To be more, my God, than just a, a step over or a pushover. To be more than just addicted. To be more than, than just a person that is broken. He said, I've called you out of that life. Be you separate. Come out from among them, says the Lord. Because he is worthy of it all. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 Come on, somebody say fight your battle. Say fight your battle. Come on, church, say fight your battle. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. 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 It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, 
surrounded, but I am surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. Hallelujah. hallelujah. This is how I fight my battles. 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 This altar is, this is how, how I fight my battles. My battles. Right here. This is how this I is where fight everybody my should battles. fight their battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This altar is open tonight. Amen, brother. Amen. This altar is open tonight. It's open at all times, but I just I know when you when you explain that the altar is open, that it's time. That the Lord wants to move inside of people's lives. And I can tell you this if you take a step, somebody will meet you there. Praise God. You know, I really believe tonight that somebody needs to hear this. That there is weapons that have been formed against you. There are things that have been coming against you in every direction, in every single way. And you've been on the verge of quitting. You've been on the verge of giving up. I want you to know that that weapon may be formed. The Bible says, but it won't prosper. And every time the devil tries to put dark into your life, I want you to know that light always wins against the dark. A weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. For the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. Cause I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Cause I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you. Hey, Carl, you know that, that story that in the Bible where he says, be instant in season and out of season? Oh, that smile is coming on your face. You already know. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Pap, if you'll turn that microphone on. And brother, just why don't, why don't you just say, tell people how God gave you the victory. Come forward today. Tell people, testify of how God has given you the victory where you were and where you are today. Glory to God.
I tell you, today's been a busy day. Uh, like Jason was there saying, well, okay, I Let's ain't been out of jiggle guys. very long and gave my life back to the Lord. I've been getting letters all over the place from prisons that were people that uh, turned their life over to God while I was locked up. Miracles taking place. God dropped in and God brought him back from the dead. He's living today watching TV in Crowley's Virginia. I was with uh, people today because they came to us healthy. <laughs> and uh, God showed up like he wouldn't, couldn't even imagine, man. I mean, tears running down his face. I seen the hand of God and everything I've been doing. I constantly let's stay in prayer all night long. God's been showing me things about the whole world is falling apart. Jesus is on the train to take, to take, take his stand and make everything right for the glory of God. And sometimes I get up and I say, man, it's watching the news and stuff just brings me down and, and everything. But I tell you, God's letting everything fall in place, man. It's all just falling right in the, in the exact place where God wants to. God's fixing to shake this world. The revival's fixing to break out. Come on, brother. Revival is fixing to hit, hit the United States. I'm probably not the United States, probably the entire world. Yes, God's yes. going to use people like y'all, man, and, and us. And, and God's going to give you the anointing. Remember, I'm saying this, and this is direct. I know it's from God. God's fixing to give people the anointing that's going to shake this entire world. Like when they was building tires to heaven, and God said he had to come down and change their language because if they would, if he wouldn't have done that, they would have exceeded and built and got there. So if they can do that without God, what can you do with God? One person could change, could, could take whole Franklin, West Virginia, or his whole area for the kingdom of heaven. Just one man or one woman. If you give everything 100% to God, there, there's no limit in the prayers of God. I've been praying and God's been touching people's lives. I prayed for some people here, Ben Kim, the other week, and they in Florida. And I used to make moonshine and all kinds of wine and stuff, and, and I would give it to people. And, and my wife told me, she said, you got to uh, ask God to forgive you for making moonshine and selling it and giving it away. And said, you got to break that curse off my family. And I did that in... Um, and I've been calling people up all week long, get apologizing for things I did when I was selling dope and drugs. Even Kim there, before I got locked up and got busted for the second time, and they give me seven years in prison. I was being in my house, I had blood dripping off my old boat. She was dope. She was scared that she'd walk in, I'd be laying in the floor dead. Then I was laying on a jailhouse floor, sleeping on the concrete. And God reached down, Father, and I could read them. And 60 inmates got saved. Three police officers give their life to the Lord, and God's doing it every day. God always puts somebody in your path that, um, that needs him. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, your age or nothing, ain't got nothing to do with it. God's going to God's got a plan for your life that you couldn't even imagine. You know what I mean? He, he's an awesome God. He's never late. Yeah, He's always on. on time. And we was talking about warfare and here the other day, men's friends of mine, like 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 says, cast down every imagination and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This war is not carnal, but mighty through God. God is fixing to give out a congressional mail for people that are serving God to go in behind enemy lines and take back what the devil stole. It is all fixing to take place in the kingdom of heaven. God wants to use people to go behind them in lines and pull, pull people out that's been bound in, in, in prison. I mean, Satan's taking POWs and people missing in action. But God's going to raise up an army with them to bring them back, pull them out. And it could be you. It could be you or you. They, it, 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 that revival's fixing to sweep the, uh, America. Revival's coming. Remember, I said that God is sick. Revival's fixing to hit this place. God's fixing to use Jason in a way I told him the other week and showed him a letter that, God, I mean, letters that just keep rolling in for people to give their life to God and God's completely changing. 
And if God can use me, he can use anybody, I tell you. I mean, he taught me all over the world for 15 years. I've been in Africa, London, Costa Rica, Paris, all over the United States and preached the gospel and seen hundreds and thousands of people get saved. Here I was nobody preaching to 20,000 people. And all out through the crowd, miracles was taking place. I only went to eighth grade in school. But school ain't got nothing, the grade ain't got nothing to do with it. What's got something to do with it is when you obey God. I mean, I told my wife when I got saved, I went to church to jump on this preacher and jerk him out of the pulpit. And God turned it all around. I was sitting at home reading the Bible. And God spoke to me and said, I'm taking you all over the world to preach the gospel. I was all excited. I hadn't been saved but a couple days and Keith got off work. And I said, God told me he's taking me all over the world to preach the gospel. She said, well, in two or three years, he might. He just got saved the other night. Boy, what's wrong with him? I said, well, God said he's taking me all over the Come world. Come on. So I went and got um, sent off for a passport. And I was on a 10-year probation. And bro, my probation officer said I couldn't do it a 50-mile area. I said, well, God said he's taking me all over the world. He said, well, it might, he might in a couple years. I sent off for a passport in seven days. I got a passport back. Glory. Another seven days. I mean, I got a passport back in seven days. And seven weeks later, I was getting off of an airplane in Johannesburg, Africa. And God did it for 15 years. Then I turned my back on God. I got, and God tried to show me that I was slacking up in prayer. And I turned my back on God and did started going dope and messing people's lives up. And getting, I thought I was bad. I was getting in fights and jumping on people. I've been shot and stabbed and everything else. God still got me free. And I ended up in jail. People said, well, you ain't supposed to make God a promise. And I was laying on the floor. And everybody in the pot I was in was in there for murder. Uh, I was in there with that guy killed Killed him two police officers in Bridgewater. I was in there with that shopping cart killer. Killed him. Uh, I was in there with uh, another friend of mine. Killed his brother. And before I left that pod, uh, 60 inmates got saved. Three police officers come in, dropped in the floor, and started weeping and crying. And then they started calling me on the phone. And I, I told them, I said, when I get out, I'm going to have cookouts, go to parks, and just lead people to, to the Lord. And when I got out, my phone, they rang my phone off. Doug, when you're having a cookout, I'm going to come do the cooking. Now, you know when an ex-drug addict with blood dripping off his elbows, dropping in the floor, God pulled a needle out of my arm and took me to the old rugged cross, and he's fixing to do it all over again. Yeah. God's fixing to take me all over the entire world again. Uh, and it's right around the corner. I've already been invited to um, Australia. Pastor's got 13 churches and they want me to come to Australia and hold revivals and stuff, but it's all about God. If God tells me to go and put me on a plane, okay. But if I don't hear from God, I'm going to stay right here in Virginia. And I've been coming back here to West Virginia because Kim goes to church in the mornings. i got to have somebody watch my dog. And even uh, my dog, man, I thought it got into some I thought it got into poison, man. You need a miracle, Jason. I ain't kidding you, my little dog got a little pug. And I took her up to this guy's house, uh, helping to move a mobile home. And I thought he got into poison, he poisoned. And I remember what God did. We did uh, uh, teach delivering ministry in Durban, South Africa. And an old woman, about 80 years old, came up to me and we was casting demons out of people, hundreds of people. And an old woman, about 80 years old, come up and jury and I was praying over this girl and they couldn't get her delivered. She kicked up about 30 demons and there were still demons down there. And she looked over at me and she said, honey, said, I'll tell you how to get that girl delivered and it'll be like that. And I said, how is that? And she got in her pocket book, she had a big old handbag on her side. She's standing there, she got in her pocket and pulled out a bottle of water. And she said, honey, let's pray that we can turn this water into the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. And she said, I'm going to pour it in that girl's mouth. She poured it in that girl's mouth. She puked up about 60 demons as big as your fist, jumped up, was running through the tent full of the Holy Ghost and fire and miracles taking place there just by taking a little shot of water. There, there was 15 preachers praying over trying to get her set free and this little old woman poured a little bit of water in her mouth like that and she was free. And 
here not too long ago. My dog was sick and I thought it was going to die. I mean, I was crying, man, just crying like a two-year-old baby. And uh, I love that little dog, you know what I mean? And uh, I didn't think it was going to make it. Jim called uh, a vet in Winchester. They said they just did their building. They couldn't see it. I called a uh, vet in Corona that did operations on dogs and everything, and they couldn't see it. That's the doctor was that vet was in an operation. And I fell down on the couch, and I said, God, you heal this dog and give us all the miracle, Lord God, and I'll go anywhere in the entire world to serve you. And I got a bottle of water, and I told Kim, I said, let's pray over and anoint this water. And I said, God, in the name of Jesus, turn this into the blood of Jesus. And I poured a little bit of water in a bowl, and like that, the dog started speaking and shaking his head, fell over in the floor, and I thought it was dead. <laughs> And a little bubble come out of his nose, and I thought it was blood. I mean, I thought it, I thought it was dead. And I reached down and got a hold of that bow and pulled it out, and it was a piece of grass in there. Wow. Just like that, God set that dog free. It was home him with my, with Kim's dad Praise and him, baby sitting at the night. But just like that, that grass came out, and God, I mean, just healed that dog. And I'm going to, well, I've been traveling, I'm going to start traveling and preaching, I'm going to take it with me, some of the meat and stuff. Well, that dog's anointed by God. <laughs> that little baby's anointed. <laughs> and I love it. God's going to use this as a, a thing. I think God put me and Jason together for a reason. Though. God showed me the other week that Jason's been praying for some things. And I told Jason up here, I showed him a letter, and I said, God's fixed the door. It's right around the corner. Because <laughs> they will be shocked at what's going to happen. They says, want God to use this place for deliverance and to set people free and break chains that where they got people bound. By God, it's fixing to happen. It's fixing to take place, man, I'm telling you. And it only takes one or two people. You be a, a, give God everything in you, be obedient, and you'll see the heavens open up. I'm telling you, you'll see Jesus stand up and man, take notice. I mean, people that you don't even think that God is going to use. And, and the miracle is, is for the unbelievers. I believe this with everything in my heart. When I was preaching years ago before I backslid on God, God gave me a vision of where people was just walking down the street to get somebody that didn't even have a hand. And, and I seen this in a vision. People would get them and pray with me, and God would give them a hand. Amen. A hand. So then when I went to Africa, there was a guy that came up in the land that didn't have a hand. And I laid hands on him and prayed for him. And when I opened my eyes, I couldn't believe it. He had little fingers about that long. Glory to God. Had fingers about that long on a nub, man. I mean, and then another woman, there was clear lines for a mile. There was a, one woman came up to me, Jerry. He was beside of me, and I was here. We had clear lines. And she had a big, they called it a quarter or something like that. There on her neck, big bag hanging down. I hadn't been saved long, and I reached up and slapped her on the head like that. And she fell out under the pair of cobble, all my eyes were completely gone. And all else, Peter fell like that, God. Just, and, God and, and he wants to do them through us. Through you. People you don't even think God's going to use. I tell you, man, God is fixed to do, show up and do some things. They ain't even, I mean, he ain't even gonna believe it, man. Here in this little place here in West Virginia, man, God is God's going to use this church. I know that the first time I come back and talk to Jason, and I love Jason's preaching. I mean, he he's anointed by God. I love his preaching. And I, somebody like me, a drug addict and an alcoholic, I used to be. I need somebody that can preach with fire. I need somebody like that. AJ ain't got a thing to do about it. Man, it's got what's in here. And I know God is sick to open the heavens up. And he's going to play every prayer you've been praying for. And laying and praying, like you said, boy, he's getting on your knees. That's the only way God's going to do it. He's got a plan for this church. And he's going to use God not just here all over the place. You didn't get this school bus for just to be part of the front. I'm telling you. Amen. Right Amen. <laughs> you, you didn't get that school bus. And God's going to, he's going to move people and there's going to be people coming in. Remember I told you this. There's going to be people leaving and people coming in. 
Because Satan is fighting this man. Like, I, I, he, he's fighting Jason. Like, he didn't believe. I just well, there's a God in heaven. That he stands strong and fast like he is. You'll be known in the nation. I'm telling you, you'll be known in the nation. And that's a promise I know it's died right from God. And you know, it's going to be obedience. And you're the man that God wants you for this whole earth. I'm not just saying it to make you feel good or pat somebody on the back because I ain't about patting them on the back. I'm about speaking for I thank God for my word. God's got a plan for this church. And for you, you're part of it. Right there. Uh, I mean, God is putting them together one, one person at a time. And there's going to be other people coming in. It's, it, it, it's going to be a revival in West Virginia. Yes. Glory to God. Man, I just want the Holy Spirit to move. I want to be obedient to everything that the Lord has told us to do. Just hang on. I don't like standing up here. I'm too high. It looks way down there. <laughs> it really does. Um, hi, everybody. Um, first, I want to say what an honor it is to always be able to speak in the house of the Lord. It's always an honor. And second of all, we have people coming from all over the country. We have Maryland and Virginia. And I don't know where you're from, but... People coming because they want to see what God's doing in this little town of Franklin, West Virginia. Yes! And shame on our people that are supposed to be our pillars and help hold up our church that are, for not being here. Shame on you. And we are blessed abundantly to have a brother, a pastor, and a friend that listens to the Lord, first of all. And the second of all, that spends more time on his knees than all of us combined. He does. I spend time with this man. I, I spend time at his home. He's always praying. He's always looking for what God wants, not what Jason wants. And shame on us if we don't back him. But I'm here to tell you this. Same God. Very same God. It is in Jason. Come on. The same God that is in you, that is in you, that is in you, that is in you, that is in me. The very same. Don't the Bible say what I do for one, I'll do for another. He has no respecter of person. Although it may seem like it, he's not any more special than us. He just spends more time with God. Thank you for bringing me back down to earth this morning. I was really upset. I just want to say thank you. For I love you, man of God. I love you too. And I want to say thanks to this man right here because he's really got inside my head this week and he's really got me thinking of I should be where I should be and not behind. I have a problem. And my problem is this. I'm a believer. Woo! Glory! I believe the book of Genesis 1-1. I believe all the way through to Revelation 22-21. Every word of it, every syllable, every period, every question mark, every exclamation point, I believe it all. Every single word. Yeah, people say men wrote it. But God ordained them to write it. He did. And it's up to us to get in it and dig in it. And I want to thank you, brother, for helping us dig in our Bibles. And, and, and you brought a light to us. And we've seen a side of you that nobody in here has seen. Thank you for that. We're trying to make this place our home. We're doing rather well. Even though the devil showed up this morning. Showed up this morning and we're still making it our home and we're trying to make it blessed. We want to be blessed, so we want you guys to be blessed. 
I promise you I've never seen anybody so happy to wash the floors, clean the toilets than these two guys right here. Y'all are lucky to have them. Blessed, hallelujah. Also, I want to say this, and I might step on a finger, or I might step on a toe, and I might make you say ouch, or I might make you say amen. I, I, I'm sorry if I do, but I'm not sorry. Amen. I've learned this in the last week, and this brother right here has taught this to me. I need to be more concerned about myself and not everybody else. It's a full-time job taking care of me. It truly is. But most of all, I want to give God thanks and I want to give Him the glory for allowing me to be here to be a part of this, to be a part of your life. To be a part of your life, brother. I thank God for allowing me to do that. Thank you for allowing me to speak and allowing me to pour out my heart. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is King. Amen. Glory. Well, Sue, I know we have some announcements that I don't want the people to miss out on. I know there's a lot of things going on before the uh, end of the year, and if you don't mind going over that for us, I really appreciate it. Let's give God some praise tonight. Come on, Jesus! Okay, on Christmas Eve, we will be having the Christmas play. It will be at 6 o'clock. And there will be a candlelight service following the Christmas program. That's going to be awesome. Y'all make sure you're here Christmas Eve. What time again? 6, Six o'clock. 6 o'clock. On Christmas Day, the service will be held at 5 p.m. There'd be a, we wanted to have it at 12. There was a lot of people that couldn't come. So we're going to have it at 5. Um, this Wednesday, we are going to reopen the clothing room down at the end of the hall woo, woo. at 2.30 until what time? Uh, 7. From 2.30 till 7. For anybody that wants to come, it's for the public. For anybody who wants to come for free clothing. Free clothing. We had a really good turnout last Wednesday. Yeah, we sure did. On Wednesdays at 4.30, we have a men's and a women's group. It will be at 4.30 on Wednesday. Band practice is at 6, following the women, or the women and the men's group. Um, and we're also accepting hats, gloves, scarves, jackets for the homeless. You can bring them in, whatever size, whatever, anything that you have you want laid around you want to get rid of. And, and I will say in regards to uh, our homeless ministry, we went to D.C., what, last week or the week before, something like that, maybe three weeks ago, and... We had the opportunity to lead 45 people to Christ in the middle of the streets. Amen. God is so good. And um, we used to always go to Red Front, but I just found out, and I, I'm, I'm investigating this right now, but I believe that they are shutting, that they shut that facility down. Where is it at? At JMU, so we will we will find where that location is, Carl. Okay, so we'll we'll find those locations. Hit me up, and then we will personally go out to the streets, and we're going to give these clothing out. Listen, I'm talking like from six o'clock to like nine o'clock, and we're going to minister to these people. And you need to be prayed up because I'm telling you, there's times where fights have just straight broke out, man, people grabbed knives out and everything else, but I, I'll tell you, God's always protected and always took us safe, and, and so, you know, these people really need help, and I, I really don't think we should kick a brother or a sister when they're down, so let's, let's give them a helping hand, and thank you, Sister Sue, God bless you, thank you so much. 
Yeah, come on, brother. Grab a microphone. I can hear you better, man. I tell you, God wants to use people. We was in Virginia Beach here a while back when I was preaching and traveling before, and we stand out on the street in uh, front of McDonald's, I think it was, being a bunch of other preachers and me standing there. And here come about five little kids, probably 10, 11 years old, coming down the street. It was on a Friday night. And we had a big tent set up and was preaching down there. And it was thousands of people coming to the tent every night. Glory to God. But there was five little kids come down the street that night and they had a little Bible in their hands about that big. Had little animals on it. And they was coming down the street passing tracks and pamphlets out to people. And laying hands on police officers and stuff. They was falling Woo! out in the middle of the street under the prayer of God getting healed. I mean, people getting saved. It was just four or five little kids, you know. And I ain't kidding you. Revivals was breaking down on the streets where these little kids was going. You know? As a little kid walked up, the police officer coming down through the area. We there one on the other side of the street. And I walked over and stood beside that police officer. I said, did you see that? And he said, man, that happens every weekend down here. So, they coming down here leading people to the Lord. Miracles taking place. I mean, people in wheelchairs was jumping out of wheelchairs, man. These little kids were laying hands on them. And, Woo, the, and the anointing of God was just awesome, man. And God, here the other night I was laying there in the bed praying, and God said, it's fixing to start all over again. And can I, can I do one more thing? I want you to go to the head on the that would come against him and try to hinder him. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I praise you and thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch him from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. God, you said that you would anoint him, Lord, to touch people, that only he can touch God. And I thank you and praise you right now, God. I thank you and praise you right now, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you, Father. On living portions, God, release him right now in Jesus' name. And thank you, Father. Come on, give Jesus a hand clap, church. Come on, if you've been blessed tonight, shout amen. Well, before we get into the word, I, I do, uh, do want to take a moment and uh, give you the opportunity to give back into the kingdom of God that we can give back into the community. So if we can have our ushers come forward, Tony and Caleb, if you'll come forward tonight, I appreciate it. I know God's getting ready to do an amazing work, but can I tell you, God's already doing an amazing work. He's doing something miraculous, amen, and we just need to be ready for what Daddy is going to do in the mighty name of Jesus. 
pray over the offering real quick. I want, I, I, let's do something tonight that Jason ain't done yet in here, or at least I ain't seen it. Tonight, before y'all give anything, if you ain't got money to give, just tell God that you're going to give a little bit of time in prayer. But tonight, before you give a dollar or whatever you want to give, I want you to ask God what to give. Not what, you know, other people or what you think you should. You ask God what to give. And now this is what I'm saying. The very, I tell you, every, everybody in here, I hear the voice of God. Everybody's going to hear God tonight. Y'all going to hear God speak to you. Every one of you. Not one of you, all of y'all. And well, here's what I want you to do. When you bow, before you give, when you bow your head, say, God, what do you want me to give? Now listen to this. The very first thought that comes to your mind is going to be God. The very first thought that comes into that mind is going to be God. God tells you to give it all, give it all, because you can't get wrong. But the very first thought after you pray, say, God, what should I give? And then when that first thought comes there, that's what God wants you to give. Now, a second later, Satan's going to try to counterfeit it and say, no, you better not give that, man. You won't have no money to eat on this week. But you obey God. When you bow your heads right now, and I want everybody to pray, God, what should I give? And that first thought's going to be Jesus. Just obey God. Then after you obey God, a second later, like I said, the devil's going to try to counterfeit it. But the first thought's what you go by. And then you give with your heart. You give with a good heart. God bless by the good message of press down, chugging together and running over. Father God, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, as, as they prepare their hearts to give, God, I ask that you would just anoint them, Father God, and let them give from their heart, God. You know that we don't care about money, God. We only care about you, but God, we know that it takes money to do your work. And so we thank you for the opportunity to give in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. If you're online and you're watching, you can give at rgowc.com, or you can also give at P.O. Box 117. Brandy Wyan, uh, Franklin, West Virginia, 26807. Hallelujah. Before we get into the word tonight, I have one more song that I, that I just feel on my heart. And I just want it to just minister to your heart tonight. You know, Tony said that the same God that I have is the same God that you have. And I had on my set list and I wasn't going to sing unless the Lord had told me to sing it. It's a song called Same God. <laughs> I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Whose love endures for generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses Who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me, for me, oh God, my God, I need you, oh God, my God, I need you now, how I need you now, oh. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling 
on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath But I've got my own giant So God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now How I need you now Rock, oh rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness You heard your children then God hear your children now You are the same God You are the same God You answered prayers back then And you will answer now You are the same God You are the same God You answered prayers back then And you will answer now You are the same God You are the same God Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now how I need you now oh, Rock, oh, rock of ages I'm standing on your faithfulness On your faithfulness Come on, give Jesus a big round of applause tonight And y'all can do better than that. We're talking about the King of kings and Lord of lords, the great I am. Give him praise in the house tonight. Bless him. Bless him. Come on, church. Amen. And God said that there'd be light. And just like that, Richard was flipping on a light switch and your eyeballs was adjusting. Nonetheless, I, I've been praying and I had to really ask God if what I heard was what I heard when God asked asked me to do what I heard. But just like you said, brother, God always is the first voice because he's the first and he's the last. Amen. He'll be the first voice that you hear and he'll be the last voice that you hear. And so, be, uh, you know, we always give the word before we get into deliverance because I believe that we should always give somebody the opportunity to know who Jesus is. Number one, because without salvation, there is no deliverance. And then number two, because if they don't have the opportunity to know who Jesus is, they can't walk in the anointing that Jesus has for them to walk in. Amen. And so I, I asked God what he wanted me to do. And he said, you remember you were writing in your book that I gave you to write in about how the enemy speaks. And so I, I've taught on this a lot. But God had given me a fresh anointing, so I literally printed off pages from the book that I wrote called Hearing His Voice. You cannot have a copy <laughs> yet. It's coming out soon, nonetheless. And we're working on the final edits, but this is from chapter 2 of How the Enemy Speaks. And the Lord had given me a message in regards to understanding how the enemy speaks. Because if we don't understand how the devil speaks, we'll never know if it's the Lord speaking to us or the devil speaking to us. Because there are times where people will say, God gave me a word, but the word didn't come from God. I had a friend, I'll tell you the truth, I had a friend, a pastor, a pastor friend of mine. I'm not going to say his name because... He's in prison now. But I had a pastor friend of mine who listened to a false prophecy from a, from a person at a camp meeting. This, this preacher came up to him and said, if you will sow your seed of whatever, God will bless you. But literally he said, if you will give an X amount of dollars, and it was like $750,000. God will bless you and your ministry will expand like you've never seen it expand before. 
So we sowed into this ministry $750,000. That's, that's almost a million dollars. Listening to a false prophecy. And in this false prophecy, not only did he lose his church, he lost his house, he lost his job, he lost everything, and to that point, the devil came in. Now, how many of y'all know that even if you lose everything and you're down to nothing, God can still be up to something, amen? So he might have lost everything, but the one thing that he hadn't lost at the time was his mind. But because he believed that God still owed him back, for the $750,000 that he foolishly listened and didn't obey. Because he did this, he found himself in depression, got into a fight with, with one of his family members, walked into his office and killed him. In prison for the rest of his life, he'll never get out. And so I, I believe it's important for us to understand exactly how the enemy speaks. And listen, I can stand up here all day and tell you, well, this is how I've heard the devil speak in my life, and this is how I've heard God speak in my life. And don't get me wrong, I will never cut shy testimonies. This has been a powerful night, power-packed night full of testimonies. Can I get a witness? Amen. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony in our love for Christ unto death. See, we don't just overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We don't just overcome by the word of our testimony. We come by overcoming by by loving Jesus until the day that we die, even if we have to die for Jesus. And I've made up my mind, I'm not turning back. So I'm not for sale. Tell the devil, you're not for sale tonight. Tell the devil that he needs to pack his ditty bag and get out the church in the name of Jesus. He needs to get out your house. He needs to get away from your family. Get up, surrender, put up the white flag because he no longer has a place in your life. He no longer has a place in your house. He no longer has a place in your finances. He no longer has a place in your ministry. The devil no longer has a place. And I'm going to tell you tonight, God had given me a word on how the enemy speaks. So I said in, in my book, I said, when using the term hearing his voice, I'm simply saying hearing the voice of God. With that being said, there are many people who believe they are hearing the voice of God, but are actually hearing the voice of the devil. So in this chapter, in this study, in this preaching tonight, I'd like for us to study how the devil speaks and also how he operates. The very few scriptures that are recorded in the Bible specifically of Satan, Lucifer, Slewfoot, the devil, you know, whatever you want to call him, I call him gone, amen. I call him down, amen. I call him defeated, amen. He is a defeated go. He is a defeated foe, and I call him out in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. But whatever you want to call him, I want you to know tonight, if you don't study how the enemy fights, you will get hit straight dead in the face and have your spiritual nose broke. You will find yourself laying on your butt, looking at the sky, saying, God, why? And he's like, because you don't know how to put the armor on. You don't know how to fight. The devil's been ripping you apart. He's been doing the two-step on you. He's been coming in, floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee, knocking you out and looking like John Cena can't see me now. Standing over top of you, laughing in your face, mocking while you want to stay at home when God says you got to be in church. And, and you know what? There's one thing that, I, that I, I agree with you, brother, that the people need my God, hallelujah, the people need to be in here that should be here. There's many of people that could be here tonight but are choosing to disobey the Lord. And I'm not saying that God is shaming them because condemnation, hallelujah, comes from the devil. But conviction comes from the Lord. And here's one thing that we need to know. If it steps on your toes, the good excuse is you was making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. What does that mean? That simply means this, any excuse will do. We could tell God why we wasn't able to do this, why we wasn't able to do that but at the end of the day you didn't want to amen and so I, I want to start in the book of Genesis if you will turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give you uh you're gonna go home and study on this amen but I'm gonna give you a rundown of what the Lord gave me to give to you tonight oh glory to God Get a little bit of mic on my mic inside of right here, Richard, so I can hear. All right. Nonetheless, if you get there, shout amen. Stand for the reverence of God's reading. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. 
Father God, I pray over the fire department right now, the alarms going off, Father God, if it's somebody that's in cardiac arrest, somebody that's hurting, somebody that's broken, Father God, somebody that is dying, God, I pray that you would reach your hand down, God, if they do not know you as Savior, God, that tonight would be the night that they would come to know you, God, that miracles, signs, and wonders, God, even as it's being recorded to the thousands online, God, that they would know that you are good and that your mercy endures forever, God. I don't know who it is out there. It could be my own family member, God. But I pray right now that you would touch down right now, God, and that this prayer would ascend unto heaven, God. I know that it's not stopped by the roof. It's not stopped by the ceiling. But I am going directly to the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son. Father God, anoint this word. Hide me behind your cross, God. Lord, just hook us inside of your word that we would fall for you better than hook, line, and sinker. That we would fall for you better than the autumn leaves in the, in the, in the, in the, in the time of fall coming, Lord. That we would just stand to our feet and worship you and adore you and know that you are good and that your mercy endures forever tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, shout it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You may be seated. I, I want to just talk to you for a moment because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You didn't come from a monkey, amen. I'm reminded, though, of this one woman that was, she was just like seven or eight years old. She was actually a little girl, and she went to her daddy and said, Daddy, where did we come from? And he said, well, you know, girl, listen. I want you to know that God made a person named Adam and a woman named Eve, and we are all descendants from Adam and Eve. And then the late the little girl says to her dad, says, "Daddy, mommy says that we were born from monkeys." And the and, and his dad and her dad said, "Well, that's her side of the family." Amen or ouch, all right? You know, God created the heavens and the earth. We did not come from monkeys. We're not Nephilim, you know. We are we are we are created by God himself. And when God creates something, he creates it perfect. God created Adam and Eve having everything that they needed. They had the water. They had the air. Could you imagine if God just put us in the earth and didn't put oxygen? We'd be, we'd, he'd breathe into us, be like, and be like, 30 seconds later, we're like, ah. Dead. Dead as a doornail, couldn't move or anything else. God always puts everything into place before he ever puts us into the place that we need to be. I want you to know tonight, I want you to know tonight that God has put you in the place that you are at tonight because God knows what you need, when you need it, how you need it, so you'll get what you need. But the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. It was without flaw. It was beautiful. However, God needed somebody to to manage it we find that in Genesis chapter 2 in the 15th verse it says this the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it in other words God put man in the garden to manage the garden and as good directors do, God gives Adam a specific instruction on what to do in the garden. I want you to notice that God put Adam in the garden, but he didn't say, hey, Adam, go figure out what you're supposed to do. God gave him specific instruction. He said this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. If you will turn over, we're going to feed you with a water hose tonight. The Lord God commanded the man of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it for in the day that you do you shall surely die so God says to Adam you are to of every tree in the garden but you're not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil for the day that you eat of it you shall surely die now let's skip down a little bit to Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 and we're going to see how the devil took the word of God and distorted the word of God so that way they could not get what God had intended for them to have. Richard, put this thing up on my monitor a little bit, please, and take the echo off if possible. All right, Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Has God said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God says, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Was Eve telling the truth? No. 
I want you to zone in here because the devil, say this with me, say any crack. Say any crack will do. The devil's looking for a gate. A crack, just sneak his fingers inside of the door and pull the door open to get inside of your life. He's looking for the temptation that he can do to, to make it inside of your life. And so I want you to notice what Eve said to the serpent. She said in verse 2, The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3, check it out. But... Of the fruit of the trees which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it unless you die. So question, did God say that, yes or no? He partly said it, but God did not say you cannot touch it. So what did Eve do? God gave me this revelation about nine years ago when I was doing a Bible study by myself. The Lord said the reason that Eve fell into temptation was because she didn't know the commandment of God. And I believe that the reason that many of people fall to the voice of the devil is because they don't know the voice of God. They don't know the power of God. They don't know the word of God. Many of people, if I said today, how many of y'all can quote one Bible scripture? Raise your hand. One Bible scripture. Keep your hand up, okay? We're going to do something for a moment. How many of y'all can quote two Bible scriptures? Raise your hand. How many of y'all can? Keep it up. How many of y'all can quote three? Raise your hand. Four, five, six, 15. Raise your hand. 26. Raise your hand. 30 Bible scriptures. Raise your hand. 100 Bible scriptures. Come on. Why does that matter? Why does it matter to understand the word? Because here we see the woman is getting ready to fall, and I'm going to explain to you why. Underline, highlight, do not touch it. Underline that, highlight it, you shall not touch it. Now, here's how this works. There's probably, I don't know, 35 people in the building tonight. Watch this. Check this out. Now, y'all move quickly. Y'all move quickly, okay? We don't we got all night. I'm going to prove my point here. Margie, make sure you tell those people right. And I'm, listen, and I'm just going to go these two rows, one from here and one from here. We'll just make it easy because it'll take a long time. I don't care. We could go through the whole thing. Go for it. Let's just see how it comes out. Why not? Why not? Yeah. This is funny right here. Who has a pen? Let me have it, please. <laughs> no, I won't have it. <laughs> Thought you said you'd give it all. <laughs> I'll give it back to you. This is a cool little pen. Glory to God. Covet not thy neighbor's pens. You can have your pen back. Go to the back. 
Tell Marilyn, Marilyn to tell the rest. This is an important announcement, I'm telling you, right now. Important. Very vital to our uh, day-to-day life. What's that? A very good one. You just tell one of them, and the one will tell the other two. This is good stuff right here, man. I'm going to prove a point. I'm like, is that Morse code? <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Roadrunner, <laughs> you're tuning in online. Like this preacher's not even preaching. I'm getting off this channel. <laughs> no, no, we're we're doing an experiment here. I I just gave a message to Mitch, and Mitch is now sending it to the next person and spreading the gospel to all these wonderful people. I don't know what you received, but. <laughs> It was important. <laughs> Richard over there really needs to know this one. This is important, Richard. Don't, don't you miss one part of it, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make sure you tell him. And tell your wife. Her life needs to know it too, amen? Your wife needs to know it too. We're halfway there. <laughs> Glory to God. From some of the worship leaders like Leb Zeppelin. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that was. That was Bon Jip. I'm just seeing if you catch that. But it all depends who you ask. Let Jeannie be the last person to get it. She's going to testify the message that the church needs to know. What's that song, Pap? Lord, help them, please. You're the next contestant on The Price is Right. What do we have for you today? It's a paper bag. Now, here you go. First fly south. Hold on. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So first, we need to fly south, but not on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Is that what you said? You know, that was actually kind of close. Give Jeannie a hand clap. Um, I said the bird flies south on Tuesday, not on Wednesday, maybe Sunday. So listen, so if you need to know that the airplane is going south to Florida for your destination to be picked up in the Keys, you need to know that it's on Tuesday, never Wednesday, but maybe it could be on Sunday if you book your flight long enough, amen. But nonetheless, you know, I've done this study before and, and I've, I put it with about 30 and it, it started off with the bird flies south on Sunday and the next thing you know your little sister is uh, throwing rocks at a dog by your cousin's house I mean you know there's just so many different obstacles by the time it exchanges into different hands and so you know it seems it seems so so harmless to misquote somebody how many times does the news media do that too they they take out one word of what somebody says and then they add blah, 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 blah. And then everybody, and then everybody hates them for something they absolutely didn't do and absolutely didn't say. That's why you shouldn't believe half of what you hear or even see, especially on Facebook or on news media. Amen. But nonetheless, and so here when we look, uh, we understand that 
if we're going to quote the word of God, we got to quote it accurately. There are places in this chapter that we will look at on how the enemy speaks. So let's look here. The woman said to the serpent, you can't eat nor can you touch it. And this is what the serpent says. The serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God does know in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you shall be as God's, little g, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave to her husband, and he did eat. Now let me just stop there for a moment and explain here what happened. Now remember, when you go back and you read in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that they were able to eat things that looked good, had good appearance, and, and appeared to be good for their body, amen? And so as we look here, Eve, I can see her now, she's reaching out, she touches it. Well, lightning bolts didn't fly from heaven, I'm still breathing, so she picks it off the tree. She didn't die, but didn't God say that when you touch it, you shall die? That's what she said. She misquoted Sure. And then once she realizes that she was able to grab it, able to hold it, she probably put it up to her lips and then decided, well, I'm going full sin, and she bites it. And she eats it. Why didn't she die instantly? Let me ask you something. Did Eve and Adam die the same day that they ate of the fruit? You say their souls died. You say they died spiritually. Is that what you said? Oh, my God. Go ahead, preacher. Their belief in how they seen God died. I, I agree with that. But what would you do if I told you what would you say if I told you they did die that day? Physically died that day. God doesn't lie. And so we have to find it in the word. I, oh my, it's about to get good up in here. <laughs> Adam and Eve, they eat of the fruit, and here's what happens. We're, we're going to hold on to that thought for a moment, and we're going to get in. She gave it to her husband, and he did eat also. The eyes of them were both open. So did the devil tell the truth? Their eyes were open. And they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves and became, hid themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, where are you? He asked him spiritually. So he did die spiritually because their identity had been taken away. See, Satan said, you will be like God. Was that the truth? They were already like God. The word knowing means to have a relationship with. So when you know good and you know evil, God was trying to tell them, I only want you to know good and never evil in your life. Every time I say this, I get in trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway. Gentlemen, look straight ahead. Ladies, look the other way. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. Go ahead and pick out what you want to eat before you get to the place that you want to eat. Don't ask your wife. The last time that happened, all of humanity was doomed. <laughs> Amen, preacher. Amen. Ladies are looking at me. I see that we are the minority. Flashing your memory. You don't remember any of this conversation. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. Hey, we can have fun in church. Amen. Hallelujah. Nonetheless, 
No, but on the, on the same note, they had a relationship. I told you I get in trouble every time I say it, but I can't help myself. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I don't know what that is. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But nonetheless, when they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day, they hid themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees of the garden. And God called out to Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said to him, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should? Should not eat. The man said, the woman gave it to me. Isn't that exactly what men do? Ha! My wife made me do it. And then here's what happens. Here's what happens. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you've done to this? And the woman said, the serpent tricked me so I did eat. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, he didn't even ask him what he did. He knew it was all a plot of the devil. Notice what God said. Who told you you were naked? They ate of knowledge that they never should have had. Adam and Eve, the Bible says, Adam lived 970 years on the place of the planet. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalms that a thousand years is as one day to God. So did Adam make it to that day? Did Adam live in a complete day if a thousand years is his one day? He didn't. So God didn't lie. Sometimes as parents, we don't have to tell our children that a car will combust the insides of your body and cause you to bleed out and to die within seconds when you're hit by an automobile for not looking both ways before you cross the street. Sometimes what you got to do is say, hey, don't cross the street. God doesn't have to tell us everything. Every reason why on the face of the earth that something is happening. And I believe today that the enemy has been speaking to many different people trying to say, well, listen, you need to seek after different knowledge. You need to go to a, to a, to a tarot card reader. You need, to, you need to go to chakras. You need to find your inner peace. You need to sit around and, and meditate a little bit. You need to get connected to the earth. And the devil is trying to tell you all of this knowledge nonsense in this new age movement nowadays to try to get you to seek out knowledge that does not come from God because God never intended you to know evil and have a relationship with evil my God Carl he only wanted us to know good and so when we look at how the devil was speaking we have to understand that he was very crafty. The word substool that, that, the, that God said in verse 1 of chapter 3, he said the, the serpent was more subtle. It means he was crafty. He was clever. The devil's not ignorant. He's been deceiving people from the beginning of time. That's why the Bible says that we're not to be ignorant of the devil's devices in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. You can always tell when the devil is speaking because he tries to tell enough of the truth to not get caught in his lies his tongue is split in two one side is partiality of truth and the other side is nothing but a lie and what he does is he takes that split fourth tongue he sticks it out into your life and he says enough of the truth to get you to walk in hook bait and sinker to grab a hold of something that looks good to your appetite and then pull you in can i tell you there is no sin upon the face of the earth that does not feel good Sin is a good feeling, or we wouldn't do it. I'm telling you, let me put it this way. Women wouldn't have children if it didn't feel good, because the pain is way too terrible to endure that just for five minutes of fun in a bedroom. Amen? Sin feels good. Lust feels good. Looking at other people that is not your husband or your wife and say, well, you can look at the menu, but you just can't touch it. Oh, don't touch. 
Don't, isn't that what we just talked about? You know, the Bible says when you look at the menu, when you, when you look at a woman with lust inside of your heart, you've committed adultery. And you've already done it. He said when you hate your brother, you've already committed murder. You've already done it. Too many people are like, well, I can get just close enough to sin as long as I don't. They're like, I, I looked at the pornography, but I didn't touch myself. It's still sin. And the devil's trying to get us hook, line, and sinker because he tells you enough of the truth for you to believe him until he stabs you in the back with a knife and twist it at the same time. So how is the devil working tonight? I want to go over just a couple more principles that, that God gave into my heart. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 1, looking at verses 6 through 12. The book of Job, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. When you get there, shout amen. Amen. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Notice here the devil is again shows up on the scene. You won't find that as much as you would think because God doesn't want to give credit to the devil, but he also wants to show when there is a time of falling and why people fell. Adam and Eve doomed all of humanity because they listened to the wrong voice. People are like, I don't need to hear the voice of God. I've got the Bible. Let me tell you something. The Trinity is not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. The Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Jesus is the Holy Bible, amen? Without the Holy Ghost, you can't hear the voice of God. And there are hundreds of millions of Christians that have never heard the voice of God a day in their life. But they hear the devil all the time. And they say stupid cliches like, the devil made me do it. Oh, he did, did he? Mm. No, you chose to sin. You chose to put that blunt to your mouth. You chose to snort the pills. You chose to drink the Bacardi 151, the, the Lori Calvert, the, the Crown Royal. You, cho you chose to do these things. Did the devil tempt you and entice you? Yes, but you chose to give the devil a crack to open up the door and to walk in your life. And so the Bible says that the devil came where the sons of God were. The one thing that you should never forget is when you are walking with God, the devil's walking behind you. And the Lord God said to Satan, where did you come from? And Satan answered the Lord and said, going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down it. You know what the devil was trying to do, sister? He was looking for somebody that he could pick apart. He was looking for somebody that he could tear apart. He was looking for somebody that he could destroy. He was looking for somebody that he could accuse. He was looking for somebody that he could stop. He was looking for somebody that would leave a crack open where there would be no hope in their life if he could get a hold of them. He was looking for somebody go to the next verse the Lord God said to Satan have you considered my servant Job notice it's not job it's Job there is none like him in all the earth perfect and an upright man one that fears me and turns away from evil and Satan answered to God Job doesn't fear you many of times the devil's saying to God Carl's not serving you. Jeannie doesn't love you. She's only with you because, because of this or because of that. Mitch really isn't where he claims he needs to be. And he's trying to accuse and say, well, let me get at him. Let me at him. I, I, I think about little Tweety Bird when Sylvester come up like suckling, suckle that. And then he was like, let me at him. Let me at him. And he was like coming after him with full force like, let me at him. Let me at him. Like he'd be able to do anything. And the devil's like, you let me at them and I'll rip them limb from limb and they'll curse you to the face. Notice here what happens. He said, Job is a perfect man. He was upright, one that feared me and turned away from evil. And, Job, and, and Satan said to the Lord, Job does not fear you. Verse 10. 
You have made a hedge about him and about his house and all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and the substance of his increase in the land. So he's trying to say to God that Job doesn't love you. He only loves you because you've blessed him. And can I tell you the reality of most Christians in their walk with God today? They're only in it for their blessing. Can I tell you, if you are only in it, you're not in it to win it, and you're not in it for God, you're only in it for the blessings that God can give you, the blessings will be taken away and you will fall on your face. Too many people are looking for a handout, but they never put their hands out. Let me say it again. Too many people are looking for a handout. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. They think that God is a holy ATM. They're like, Psh, here's the Bible scripture. Quote the Bible scripture. Name it. Claim it. Time to withdraw. Oh, God, hallelujah. Here comes my Lamborghinis. I mean Lamborghinis. Amen. And they're stuck in a rut. Can't get out and wondering why they're going to hell in a handbasket and their life is in shambles. It's simply this. Because they treat God like a holy ATM. They treat the Bible like he's Jehovah genie. That they could rub the Bible blow some dust off of it and that they could ask God for anything that they want and they would receive it and they take words in certain scriptures and they cherry pick it and quote it but somebody say with me tonight that every text has context if you take the text out of the context what are you stuck with a con and I believe that many of people are misquoting the Bible many of people are just coming to God for the blessings and let me tell you something the devil will rip you apart I'm going to tell you, if you're only coming to church to get out of jail, if you're only coming to church to help your PO, if you're only coming to church so you don't fail a drug test, if you're only coming to church because of this or that, you will not be rooted and grounded. And when the church tells you about your sin, when the pastor preaches on how you're living like hell, and you say, ouch, oh my God, you don't say amen, and the devil gets you to walk right out the doors because you're not rooted and you're not grounded because you are only there for the blessing and not the creator the bible says in the last days that people would serve the creation rather than the creator and so the bible tells us here that the lord god said oh my god hold on let's go to verse 11 but put forth your hand now notice that satan had a conversation with god and said put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face question did god do that yes or no did God touch what Job had? Yes or no? Well, what about the scripture, the Lord giveth in the Lord? Do you know God didn't say that? Job did. Do you know many of people quote that scripture and say, well, brother, you know the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. No, he doesn't. Well, the Bible says it right there. Yes, you're, every text has context. When you take the text out of the context, what are you stuck with? A con. So don't cherry pick the Bible. Understand the context of the scripture. Job was depressed and he didn't know what to say. He didn't recognize that the devil had stole everything that he had. So he said, you know what? God gave me everything that I own. If God wants to take my children, if God wants to take my family, if God wants to take my money, if God wants to take my house, if God wants to take my servants, if God wants to take my 11,000 animals, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. But God didn't take Jack Spratt. The devil did. In the book of John, in the 10th chapter, in the 10th verse, the Bible says that Jesus said that I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. He did not say I have come to give you life and more, more redundantly. He said I came to give you life and life more abundantly. He said I came to give you an abundant life. But he says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The devil took it from Job. Let's go back to the book of Job and let's look at that 11th and 12th verse. He said, put forth your hand now, touch him, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord's response was this. The Lord said to Satan, behold, which means look. Somebody say, look. look. Say, wake up. Wake up, wake up. Amen. Hallelujah. Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not forth your hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of God. Notice, don't go anywhere, notice here. All that he has is in your power. Did God lie? God cannot lie. The Bible says, let God be true and everybody else be a liar. So God didn't lie. God told the truth. And here's what he said. He said, all that he has is in your power. Why is that? Margie, why 
did the devil have all that Job had? The Lord had to allow it. Why did the Lord have to allow it? I know you didn't say that part, but I, I'm saying that part. You're right. The Lord allowed it, but why did the Lord allow it? Did, did the Lord hate Job? Some of you might be thinking tonight because of all the hell you've been going through that God must hate you. Don't be stupid to how the devil's been attacking. Why was the devil able to take away Job's children and take away his animals? But leave his naggy wife. Why? That's close. Destiny. Where did that come from, Destiny? Where? Destiny said that the devil had rule over the earth. Raise your hand if you believe that the devil had rule over the earth. But doesn't the Bible say that God created the heavens and the earth? Didn't God say that God gave Adam to manage it in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15? Adam messed it up. Now you're getting it, girl. So Adam messed it up. And what he did is he gave the legal right, somebody say the legal right, to the devil. Well, this is a good teaching tonight. He gave the legal right to the devil. He stepped down from his management position. Imagine, let me, let me break this into layman's hillbilly Pendleton County language for you tonight. Amen. Imagine having a company. You have a lot of animals that, that you're taking care of in this company. And you're the manager of this company. And one day you decide to say, forget it, I'm done. And you do something so bad that the owner still loves you but has to take you out of the company. And when you come out of the company, the next runner-up gets your position. That's exactly what happened. When Adam was taken out of the garden, the devil was still in there. So he took control of the earth. And he set his kingdom up on the earth. So all that Job had, the devil was able to take away from. Other than Job because he was perfect. Job didn't sin before God. He loved God. He was born imperfect but as far as his flaws he never praise God he was born imperfect the Bible tells us but because he never sinned after he was born the devil couldn't attack him imagine I'll use Carl for an example I love picking on him amen Carl was in jail Carl, did you go to jail because you did nothing? Of course not. <laughs> he laughed. He was like, no, dude. Had a rap sheet from here to Florida. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Amen. You do too. I did too. Hallelujah. Bought my first gun. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. After my record was a sponge, that felt amazing nonetheless. Glory to God. So here we find that Carl was able to go to jail because he did something wrong. Say legal right. The judge had a legal right to put you in jail because you did something illegal. God is the judge of the universe. Remember, everybody likes to quote, only God can. Judge not, lest thou art willing to be judged. For the measure you judge, you shall be judged also. He didn't say don't judge. He said, unless you're willing to be judged. I'm willing sometimes. I'm going to tell you right now, some people need to get their head out the sand, grab a hold of both ears, bend over and pull their head out their rear. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, it comes with a cost and it comes with a price. And Jesus paid the cost and Jesus paid the price. Glory, hallelujah. So as we look at scripture tonight, we got to recognize that the devil had legal right to Job's life. Who had to get that oil? Come on. 
And here's what happened. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, let me just show you this. And I just want to give you just a little bit more in this teaching tonight. Because I really feel like you're going to benefit from it. Let's look at chapter 1, verses 13 through 22. And there was a day when the sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. This is Job's family, by the way. There came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And Sabines fell upon them, took them away, and they slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I am the only one who escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven. Now, notice the fire of God did not fall from heaven. It was a fire of the devil. It was a false fire. But that's the only way that they could explain it, that it was God's fire that fell down and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I am the only one to escape to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another knocking on the door. The Chaldeans made three bands, fell upon the camels and carried them away, slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I'm the only one that escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness smote the four corners of the house that fell upon the young men and they are all dead I am alone the only one that escaped to tell you then Joe's, Job rose up rent his mantle shaved his head fell down upon the ground worshipped the Lord and said naked I came out of my womb and naked I shall return the Lord gives and the Lord takes away blessed be the name of the Lord and in all of this Job sinned not nor did he charge God foolishly could you imagine putting yourself in that position? You're home at your house. You get a knock on the door. The police officers give you a report. Your children all died in a car accident. There was a tornado that swept them off. The, the, the bank comes by and says that, you know, you, you're supposed to have been paying your rent, but we defaulted on your loan and somebody else bought the bank and so we no longer have records and you're now going to have 30 days to be evicted out of your house. By the way, your farm that you had burnt down in a flame and you have nothing left to prove of it. And while you're there, more people are knocking on the door, more people are knocking on the door and the only person that you have left to help you is a naggy spouse that tells you, why don't you just give up on life and die? Put yourself into Job's position. When we look here, we got to understand the way that the devil attacked was strategically. The only reason that Job's children were protected, if you look at Job chapter 1 verse 5, you'll find out Job sacrificed animals every day that just in case. Go over to Job chapter 1 verse 5. Look at this just for a moment. Some of y'all are like, man, this is a long message. Well, listen, you're going to need this. Put it in your pocket. If you're not having trouble with the devil right now, you will later, I promise you. Amen. Job chapter 1, verse 5. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of all of them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. So Job did it continually. So the first place that the devil attacked Job was with his animals. And then he waited for the moment that they went back to drinking, which is a sin. You can quote, Jesus turned the water into wine all you want. But right here, the Bible shows us that they died because they were eating and drinking wine at their eldest brother's house. And they all were killed because of the incident of not following God. Say they gave place to the devil. The first place that Satan attacks is by taking away the offering or the sacrifice. Can I tell you the first place he's still attacking today is by trying to take away your salvation. He's trying to tell you that, that you never were truly saved. He's trying to tell you that you never gave your heart to Jesus. He's trying to tell you that Jesus isn't real. He's trying to tell you that, that you could follow some other religion and all these other things and that Allah can save you and Buddha could save you and Thor can save you. But can I tell you that nobody can save you but Jesus? And so the first place the devil's trying to attack in our life 
is literally strategically at the offering. If he can steal away the word of God from your heart, you'll never get the salvation in your heart. Amen? And so in Job chapter 3, verse 25, we find the place as to why the enemy was able to attack into Job's life. There was one thing that Job never gave God. Job had a spirit of fear. Even though he was a perfect man, he was afraid. His actions showed that he was afraid. Carl, what was Job afraid of? His children dying. Look here, Job 3.25. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet, yet trouble came. Can I tell you the first place that the devil will enter in is the first place that you leave the door open? They left fear. Little stuff. I was deeply afraid of spiders. Destiny and I was sitting here in the, in the sanctuary talking about Jesus. She was over there, I was right there. And I seen this spider crawling across the floor. And my first reaction back in the day would have been, kill it! But at this time, God had taken fear out of my life. So I reached over and I picked it up. And I walked it out the door in my bare hands. And I let it go. Fear left. When we stand on the word of God, we stand away from fear. Now listen, this message really could have been like three different nights and we could have looked at, you know, the book of Genesis. Then the next night looked at the, the book of Job. And then the next night looked at the book of Matthew. We won't get into the book of Matthew tonight. But you go back and read Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 and you'll see how the devil tried to attack Jesus. But I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to open up to 1 John chapter 2. Who said that? Yeah, come on. Glory to God. 1 John chapter 2. These are going to be the three ways that the devil's going to try to attack you every time that he tries to attack. In 1 John chapter 2, let's look at verse 15 and verse 16 and verse 17. Love not the world, neither the things of the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world passes away, the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God shall abide forever. Amen. This last scripture here, shows every time how the devil attacked Adam and Eve, attacked Job, and even tried to attack Jesus in the garden. Any time that you see the devil speaking in your life, he's going to do it three different ways. The lust of the flesh. Remember, Jesus was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he became hungry. The first thing the devil said to him is, if you're the son of God, command these stones to be turned into bread. And Jesus said, you can live by nothing but bread alone. Come on, man of God. The second thing, Jesus is taken up to a high pinnacle of the temple in Matthew chapter 4. And Satan says to him, if you are a man of God, throw yourself down because God will give his angels charge over you. And if you jump off, it will not hurt you. He wanted him to prove himself through pride. How many times does the devil want us to become prideful? To be lifted up in arrogance and say, oh, look at me. Brother, I'm appreciative that you said that I'm such a man of God. And I, I'm thankful for that. But the only thing good about me is the God that's in me. I'm not a good preacher without the good preacher that's inside of me. Amen. And it's so easy for me to soak in that word, but if I don't give credit to the creditor, 
I'm just as lost as a lost puppy in Walmart. Pride is how the devil will break many people. How about when you're struggling, but you're too prideful to ask for help? Because you use a scripture that says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or beg for bread. There's a difference before and between begging and asking. Pride will break you faster than you know. The next place, the devil takes Jesus and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he says unto Jesus, he says, Jesus, all these things I will give to you. And remember, Jeannie, he could give it to him because Satan owned all the kingdoms. But he never owned the glory thereof. He said, all these things I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And what he say? You shall worship the Lord thy God and only him shall you serve. The Bible says in the book of Matthew in the fourth chapter in the 11th verse when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. The Bible says that he left and the angels came to minister to him. Can I tell you, there's many a people that are fighting the same fight left and right and left and right, and they keep falling into the same, ta same temptation. But if you'd stop falling in, the devil would walk away. Do you know why? Because he's looking for another strategy on how to stop you. But he's too stupid to do it any other way. Because the only way, we're humans. We're, we're three-part beings, just like God is a three-part being. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we're will, mind, soul, emotion. We're, we're three-part beings. We, we're, a, we're, we're a soul that possesses a spirit, and we live in an earth suit. So the only way the devil can attack us is with our lust, with our pride, and what else? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes pride of life. So when you go out here this week and you're tempted to sin, he's going to come at you the same three ways he came at you before. Whether it's addiction, whether it's bondage, whether it's anger, whether it's hatred, whether it's giving people a piece of your mind instead of giving people a piece of his mind, he's going to come at you every single time the same three ways. He's predictable. He's stupid. He's an idiot. He said, don't talk about the devil like that. Why not? He's defeated. If God had given me the chance, I'd sucker punch him. Come on, somebody. And wouldn't run away. But you know, times in my life, I know it sounds crazy. I've been thankful for the devil. Because every time that sucker comes after me and I get broke down, the Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. And I get back up stronger and smarter. And if you would take the falls that you've had and learn from them, you'd be able to walk out this place and chase hell with a water pistol. Do you understand me? But the problem is too many people are ignorant of how the devil works. That's why the devil didn't want you to pay attention tonight. That's why the devil didn't want you to hear the message that I had to share with you tonight. See, listen, I can give you through Jesus deliverance, but if you don't learn how to fight, your deliverance will never stay. You will get free, and then the devil will come back in. And you'll be seven times worse than what you were because you never learn how to keep the door shut. We've dealt with so many different thousands and hundreds of thousands of different demons in this last 15 years of ministry. We've cast out demons left and right and seen God move in miracles, signs, and wonders. And I want you to know that the one thing is, is that the devil always tries to hide. He always tries to lie. He always tries to tell enough truth not to, not to get in trouble, not to be seen. He's always low key. He's the wolf that's dressed in sheep's clothing. He looks like a sheep. He's smells like a sheep he puts some sheep cologne on but he howls like a wolf when the moon comes out and I believe that many people are falling into the trap of the devil 
And I want to say woe unto you, all of you. Woe unto myself if we're not smart enough to understand the devil's devices and how he's plaguing your mind, trying to tell you another uh, one, one drink won't hurt, one pill won't hurt, one joint won't hurt, one cigarette won't hurt, one Bacardi 151 won't hurt, one smearing off ice with vodka won't hurt, one drinking and driving one time won't hurt until you kill one precious child and you're in prison for the rest of your life. He'll try to tell you that one thing won't work and then cannot tell you it was one thing that caused humanity to fall. One thing always hurts. I'm going to leave you with this. Let me see that water bottle, please. I like water. It's good for you. She said, no, sir. No, that Mountain Dew. She likes that natural spring. She likes water, too. So let's say I take this water that's very, very clear. You'll drink it right now, right, Sue? You drink this water right now? You would? Yeah, that's good. If I put dirt in it, would you drink it? You'd, you'd beat my butt. But what if it was the only water bottle and we were locked in here because we were besieged round about and we couldn't get out and you had 30 days in here. You wouldn't drink the water? A little bit. You would drink it. But what if it had poo in it? Just, just one little turd. Would you do it? Why not? He said, it depends on how long he hadn't drank. He's desperate. <laughs> Why do we expect ourselves to drink from a well that is stagnant, that's not flowing, that is dirtier than a pond with scum on the top of it? You say, that was inappropriate for church. Get over yourself and get over your religious high horse. I'm giving a point here. Can't stand religious nuts. Amen. I love Jesus, and I'm real, and I tell it how it is. And the fact is, you wouldn't put up with a little dog duty in your life, and especially not in your water. So why do we put up with a little bit from the devil? A headache comes, we're like, well, I know the Lord could take it away, but I'm just going to put some Tylenol into my liver to kill myself instead of praying. And I'm not coming against you know, Tylenol and ibuprofen or anything like that. But what I'm saying is, pray first. Seek God first. He said, the doctor said, who gives two flips of a wooden nickel what the doctor said? Are, are, are you trusting in a practitioner or a physician? You say, well, my physician's a physician. Well, go to the great physician. Amen? He's a healer. He's not a practitioner. He don't practice squat. He does it all. Amen? He's not practicing until he gets better. He's perfected the art. We need a trust in God. When we need healing, the devil says, ah, oh, it's too late. Nothing's too late till it's gone. You say, well, what about the people that died before their time? Well, nobody dies before their time. They do if they choose to, but God still knows when they're going to die. And so we need to stop Blaming God for all of our problems and start blaming one or two people, ourselves or the devil. And if it was our fault, we need to forgive ourselves because we can't get delivered if we don't have forgiveness. Amen? Pap, come on up, man of God. You got this. Jesus does. I just want to ask if there's anybody in here tonight that doesn't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If not, this altar's open for you to come up here. And I'll say this. If you, if you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, if you will make that commitment to come to this altar and surrender your heart, and soul to Jesus Christ 
It'll be the greatest day of your life. I'm standing witness of that. There, I have three children. And when they was born, that was a great day. But there's no comparison to that. The day that I give my heart and soul to Jesus Christ was no comparison to those births. It was a birth of myself. I became a new person. So I'm standing here before you tonight and I'm asking you if there's anybody in here that doesn't know him as your Lord and Savior, please come forward. Let us pray for you. And I ask you to, to accept him into your heart. Is there anybody in here that would like to come forward that doesn't know him? So I'm saying, with that being said, everybody in here knows him as their Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for that. I'm lost, baby. Ah, you're right on time, brother. But I want to say this. I've said it before, and I, I can't say it enough. I have one regret in my life. And that regret is I waited 50 some years to accept him into my heart. I feel with everything, even though that I didn't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, he still was blessing me all through that. Even though I was a sinner, God was looking out after me. He took care of me. So I feel like by me waiting for 50 some years to accept him, I shortchanged him. Because I don't feel like I have enough time on this earth to repay him for everything that he's done for me. So I regret waiting so long. So if you're out there, even online, and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, don't wait. Take that step. Accept him into your heart. It'll be the greatest day of your life. Don't be like me. 70 years old and regretting that you waited for so long. Because it's very it's a very easy thing to do to accept him. Our God is a loving God. He created each and every one of us. So why does people feel like that they have to put him on hold in their lives? Because if you just bring him into your life, your life will get better. I can say that I lived for Satan for 50 some years. And I'm not proud of that. But I did it. And one day, one day, when I'm standing in front of him, I hope that he doesn't hold that against me. Because since I've, since I've known him and I've brought him into my life, the Lord and Savior I'm talking, my life has improved. I was, I was a very hateful man. I had a lot of hatred in my heart. You name it, I did it. And I'm not, I'm not speaking proudly of that. But Jesus changed all that. He took that hatred for me. He humbled my heart. I've had people say, I've never seen a 70-year-old crybaby. I'm guilty. 
Amen. But they're tears of joy because I have Jesus in my heart, and he humbled me. He took that hatred and replaced it with love. How can you say that's wrong? How can you not want that? How can you not want that love in your heart that everybody you look at, did you say, mm, I don't know about that cat, but still yet you love him. That's what Jesus did for me. He took that judgmental out of me, and he gave me love for everybody. That can't be wrong. So why does people not want that? Why? Why do they make it so hard just to... Are they afraid to cry? I did. It was tears of joy. Because it was just like when I got on my knees and I asked the Lord to take that from me, I give it all to him. It was just like yes. they drove a D10 dozer off of my shoulders. The burdens that I was carrying that I didn't need to carry, all I had to do was give them to him. But I carried him for so long. That's why I can stand here in front of you all tonight and tell you. that the greatest thing in your life would be to accept the Lord and Savior into your heart. Now, this may not be like the best altar call that you've ever heard, but that's what was in my heart, and that's what I spoke. And I speak that from my Lord and Savior because I'm just so happy that he accepted me after me putting him on hold for so long. You know, <laughs> it's just amazing how forgiving he really is. I could sit down here on these steps and probably it would be 4 o'clock in the morning, and I still can't tell you everything, all this sin that I committed in my life. I can't. I can't it would take that long. That probably still wouldn't be done. But I can say that within a few seconds, on my knees in Brandywine, West Virginia, the Lord took all that from me, and he created the new man. So how could you not want that? How could you not want to be reborn, new, like a newborn baby, starting over from scratch, from new, slate white clean? Jesus can do that for you. That's, that's, that's so if you're here tonight, and you're here and you would say, Pastor, it's like, I've been fighting at every turn. With every head bowed and every eye closed. If you say, I'd like to give it all to Jesus. I want to give my heart. I want to give my soul. I want to give my life to Jesus. Would you just slip up your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Maybe you're like Carl who backslid and fell flat on his face but then looked up. And you'd like to make a stand tonight to say from this day forward, my life is going to be all about Jesus. I'm going to give it all. I'm going to walk the walk. I'm going to talk the talk. I'm going to let God move in amazing ways in my life. Say, Pastor, that's me tonight. Hallelujah. Most gracious and heavenly Father, God, will come before you tonight and we just thank you for your great goodness. 
God, that we may sing of your goodness, the goodness of you, God, that you are working all things together, Lord. You're working it all out even when we're falling apart, God. You're right there by our side. Lord, I pray that we could trust in you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding, God, but in all of our ways acknowledge you that you would direct our paths. Let us be inside of your word as you are in us and we are in you, God. Help us to have the victory in the name of Jesus, Lord, that we would overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimonies. May we walk the walk and talk the talk and spread the fire, God, from one person to the next. May the, the sinner closest to hell get saved tonight, God. If you're online and that's you and you, you want to give it all to Jesus, just say, I want to give it all. Type it in right now. Say, I want to give it all, Pastor. I, I want to give it all, God. I want you to have all of me. Take all of me. Glory, God. We praise you. We give you glory, God. We give you honor, God. You're deserving of it all. You're worthy of it all, God. May you walk with us and talk with us and call us your own. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, friends, we're going to get ready to go into the deliverance service. I'm going to give you all 15 minutes. If you got to use the bathroom, if you want to meet and greet with people, feel free to do so. But in 15 minutes, about 7.55, we're going to get directly into deliverance service, and God's going to start setting the captives free in the mighty name of Jesus. Be sure if you're going to be staying for deliverance service,